So, Sarah, are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, all good. I can hear. Fantastic. So, Sarah is our International Collaborative Ground Round Lead, based all the way in Australia. Sarah, what time is it over there in Australia? Uh, 6.50 p.m. Jeez. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Is it okay if I leave this in your capable hands to introduce our three fantastic healthcare leaders? Absolutely. It sounds like a plan. Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. See you all guys later. Beautiful. Alrighty, so hello everyone and welcome to our audience um, across the globe today and all our panellists. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the ICDRX breakfast session, uh, which will be looking at finding fulfilment in your career and leading with purpose um, in everything that you do. Uh, so we're really excited to have such a global audience today. So please do comment in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from um, and use it as a place to ask any questions throughout the event. I'll be keeping an eye on it and we'll be happy to ask uh, any of our speakers today any of the questions that you do post. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Sarah. I'm a final year student uh, down at Melbourne in Australia. Um, and today we'll be talking to a number of healthcare professionals about their journeys and the lessons that they've learned along their way um, and how they've found a career that they love uh, and that continues to provide fulfillment for them. So our wonderful speakers today are uh, Dr. Kate Burnett from the UK and Dr. Dinesh Palapana and Dr. Vijay Roach from Australia. Um, I'd love if each of you could uh, introduce yourselves rather than me sort of um, give a spiel. I'm sure you'll do a much better job of it than myself. Um, so if we start with Kate, I'd love to hear, um, I'm sure everyone in our audience would love to hear what you do in your day-to-day -day life um, and why you've sort of decided to join this panel today. So, um, so thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's really wonderful to be here. Before I just say anything about myself, Thank, can, I, can I thank you and not just you, Sarah, but each and every person that's joined this platform today um, and just take a moment just to value you. Um, you've spent your life or you will spend your life uh, caring for others, caring for yourself. Uh, and it's, it's um, a hard, a painful and fulfilling thing to do. So whatever career you've gone into, healthcare is about caring. So caring for yourself and caring for others. Um, and I'm a patient, I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I have kids that worry about me. Um, in healthcare, every moment matters. So I'd just like to value just for a moment, just those moments that we'll share together. So my name's Kate Burnett, I'm a urologist, a urological surgeon, I, I work in the UK. Um, I spend a little bit of my time as a urologist and I spend most of my time as a system psychodynamic coach. So I work with the, the um, Centre of Right Relationship Global Central Right Relationship, the Gottman Institute, the UK Center of uh, Human Behaviors, the USA Center of Human Behaviors. So I'm interested in fulfillment and leadership and care, true elements of care. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Kate. Uh, and Vijay, can we hear a little bit about uh, why you've joined us today and where you're from? Thanks, Sarah. I'm here because you asked me to be here. Um, I'm BJ Roach, I'm an obstetrician and gynaecologist, a, a bulk and a clinician, and I think I characterise myself as an accidental leader. Um, I, I suppose that I had ambitions and I wanted to achieve certain things, but I maybe can technical VSL turn off your microphone because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, and, uh, and, and I am now currently the president of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. And I'd echo what Kate said, is that I think that the single greatest, Kate just gave it to us, is um, to make another, that you can give another human being, is to make them feel valued. And so as a recipient of what you said, Kate, thank you, I'm grateful. Wonderful, thanks, VJ. Uh, and Dinesh. Hey Sarah, thanks a lot for having me and uh, hello to everyone that's uh, been joining this panel and hi to Vijay and Kate. Um, it's a privilege to share some time with you this morning in the UK, evening for us. Um, I work in the emergency department at the Gold Coast University Hospital in Australia. It's the busiest emergency department in the country and we see somewhere uh, north of 100,000 patients a year. I have a spinal cord injury uh, and have uh, lost function below the chest and in my hands as a result of a motor vehicle accident. So I uh, also co-lead a spinal cord injury research lab 
at Griffith University in Gold Coast, where we are doing some cutting edge work to restore function in me, hopefully, one day. Um, I work with the Disability Royal Commission of Australia, and um, I do work around inclusion and diversity. So um, it's uh, very timely that VJ is on this panel as well, because I have a colleague at this hospital who just had a spinal cord injury and uh, his dream was to do ONG. So maybe I'll convince you to take him on. Excellent, thank you, Dinesh. So I think the first question I'd really love to hear um, from all of our speakers today is a little bit about sort of why you entered the career path that you did, specifically in the case of Kate, urology or ONG for VJ and ED, Dinesh, um, and sort of how that has changed over the, um, over the course of your career. I know as a final year med student, I think I'm meant to have my made up according to some of my colleagues and I absolutely have no idea what I'm going to do, um, but I'm hoping that along the way I'll figure it out and, and piece it together and I'd love uh, to hear how you guys found that, that career that, that fulfills you and that continues to make you happy. And I know most of you are clearly doing multiple things outside of just uh, sort of your clinical practice as well. Um, it, perhaps we'll go in the, in the same order, Kate, if you don't mind. Yeah, so, so, um, so, so thank you. Um, I, I started out in spinal surgery, actually. Um, and what I recognised was that um, what was most important to me was to have a family um, and to have children and have space and time with my children and to be the best mum I could in service of my children, in service of my family. Um, and so um, spinal surgery was busy, it was, it was um, hard work, it was really fulfilling, I, I loved it. And I recognised that um, I couldn't be a spinal surgeon and the mum I wanted to be. I'm not saying everybody is like that, but I'm just saying that for me, that, that's what happened. And, um, and I gave up actually as a doctor. I, I said, I, I don't want to be a doctor. It's not for me, I want to be, I want to be a, you know, a great mum. And I found urology actually, and I fitted really well the context of urology. I was really passionate about some really um, weird and wonderful things, spinal injuries, uh, neuromuscular disorders. Um, and I could fulfill my academic interest and be a mum and be a urologist. And then what, what happened was I became a urologist. The context fitted me, I fitted the context. Um, and also I still searched, you know, I searched for a human connection. I searched for a love. I searched for what actually was care and how could I feel that care myself and how could I give the care that I wanted to give. Um, but I struggled really to get that sort of connection to care. And so I, I, I um, looked at some psychology, looked to do some psychology to learn about uh, human behaviours, to learn about connection um, and to learn about how to be the best I could be so I could be the best for others, including my family, including my children, including my patients, including my colleagues. So that's my journey really. And um, some of that is a utoria of hope. You know, when I'm a better psychologist, when I'm a, when I'm a better leader. Um, and some of that is recognizing that humanity is not always happiness. It's a spectrum of emotion. And just to be with the uncomfortable in the comfortable, that's me. Thanks, Kate. And Vijay, I know you're obviously the president at Ranscock, but also do some important work with a number of organisations um, along the side of that. How collectively do those sort of confirm for you that you're on the right career path and that you're doing what you love? Mm. I don't even know that it's important to say that I'm doing what I love, because I think if I go right to the beginning, I decided to study medicine because I felt an obligation to save the world. And so that was going to be my journey on the planet. And I wonder whether there's a few people out there who are listening to who can relate to that need to feel needed, you know, the need to try to do everything for everybody and be the hero and solve all the world problems. And I saw medicine as a vehicle for doing that. So I wasn't particularly interested in medicine. And I'm not sure that I really am. Um, I, I mean, I think clinical medicine is interesting and it's stimulating and uh, intellectually. But ultimately, what I think I came to discover, and I love listening to Kate's 
description and words that she uses because it was about learning about the human, learning about people. I mean, if you get enjoyment of interacting with the person who's in front of you, then every day is an exciting day. Every conversation is an exciting conversation. And I like what Kate said also, which is not that we, we don't need to sanitise the story either. We don't need to make it perfect. We don't need to make it wonderful. We don't need to make it okay. So I think that for me, obstetrics and gynaecology is an opportunity to sort of touch humanity. There's a real intimacy. There's a huge element of trust. It's not just transactional. I think that women in the context of having a baby or women in the context of their gynecological health, maybe women in general, and I know that's the pathway to go down, but have a connection with their body and their being, which to then be allowed into that, to be part of that story and part of the discussion, I think is extraordinary. And the, the side area that you alluded to was perinatal anxiety and depression. And I think that you cannot se separate mental health from health. There is no health without mental health. And so I think that that makes me, I was just reflecting then, is that then obstetric and gynecology becomes less important to define that that's my career, as in my career in medicine, but it's in caring, it's in looking at the person who's in front of me, it's in interacting with people. And I, I think I'm less inclined to want to be defined by a title or a position. And I think that would be my, you know, when you said, I'm not there yet, I haven't defined where I want to be, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, to, to the audience who's out there, when that feels so overwhelming, all this pressure, if you're not on the training scheme by tomorrow, it's all over, then it's not true. And that's when old people like me can say things like that because we know it's not true. When you're in your, and that can be really irritating when someone old like me says that to you, but it will be okay. And if your basic why, my basic why hasn't changed. It's just that the way in which it expresses itself is, is different as the journey's gone along. Absolutely. And I think um, what you've said resonates probably with a lot of us who are on the earlier end of our um, career pathway. Um, and Dinesh, obviously you're, you're working as, a, as an ED doctor, but also happen to be qualified as a, as a practicing lawyer from my understanding. Tell us a little bit about how, how that com came about and, and sort of what that's taught you along the way. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, and BJ and Kate, your thoughts are yeah, amazing, actually struck a chord with me. I uh, never grew up wanting to be a doctor. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I was thinking about what to do. And uh, my mom has been a really big influence on my life. So we were chatting one day and she said, why don't you study law? And I, at the time I thought, hey, that's, that sounds like a good idea. So I went to law school and um, things were going well, but I experienced depression when I was in law school. So I had depression and anxiety and panic disorder. And I became agoraphobic after a period of time. So all these things came to a head where I was in my house for weeks and it was probably one of the darkest periods of my life but it was also one of the best things that ever happened to me because i started dealing with doctors and um, the health system then and i um my whole life changed when i came out of the depression so my mum likes to say these days that um by helping one person you mightn't change the world but you'll change the world for them and that's really a philosophy that like, it, it's so meaningful to me so because my whole world changed as I came out of depression I thought what if I could do this for someone so that's why I decided to do medicine and I finished law school and I started medicine um, and with regards to emergency medicine in uh, 2010 I had this lecture from an emergency physician who's also the director of our ambulance service in this state and he was talking about emergency medicine and what he does and he had all these photos of him on the roadside doing all these crazy procedures and I thought wow that's what I do because I thought you know that's the that's one of the front lines of medicines where you see people and they come in they're injured and they're going through trauma and you can make a difference in that point in time. 
um, until Kate or BJ comes along and does the rest. But um, that that really excited me, that thought. So funny thing is, uh, a few weeks later, I had a car accident and I got a spinal cord injury. And in the ambulance was that emergency physician. So after giving me a lecture, he was now there looking after me as a patient. And, you know, I, I think in those few minutes that I shared with him in the ambulance, he's taught me something really important. And that is another philosophy that I really like, is that um, people might not remember what you do for them, but they'll remember how you make them feel. And that's leading on from what VJ said. So, you know, it's been 11 years and I'm talking to you uh, and everyone across the world about this guy because I, I don't remember what medications he gave or what procedures he did, but I remember how he made me feel that night in the ambulance. And I think that's, those two things are really powerful opportunities that we have in medicine to make a difference in someone's life. And like VJ said, it might not be the technical stuff we do, it's the way we can make people feel, and it's that trust. So I um, went along and um, came back to medical school and it was, um, had a lot of challenges because it was a doctor who, couldn't, who was in a wheelchair and couldn't use his hands, but eventually I found ways to do things. And one night in um, the ED when I was an intern, one of my bosses said, you know, what do you really want to do? Like, what, what, uh, what do you love? And I said, well, I love this. And she's like, well, we can make it happen. Why don't we um, get you work in the emergency department or we'll figure out ways? So. Ever since then, I've been working in the ED, and um, I've worked out how to do all sorts of stuff. Um, I've sutured people. I've, I was fiddling around with intubation the other day with uh, video-assisted technology. So I've figured out how to do a lot of things, but one of, um, a doctor's job is also really cognitive, so you can easily lead a resus team from a wheelchair. Or I see most of my patients independently. But it's been really nice to have uh, bosses and consultants that believe um, in thinking outside the box and uh, making things work, which our emergency physicians have been. Um, the other place that I've spent a lot of time in our hospital actually is ONG because the consultants there were very open as well and I uh, worked there as a resident and I had a great time. I actually love, love it and um, it's, a, it's just been a really nice journey but every single day I go to work I feel extremely privileged. I can't get to. I, 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 don't, I can't believe I get to do this as a job, and I think um, we we are really lucky. Thank you, Dinesh, and I'm sure everyone, um, including myself, found uh, your words very inspiring about sort of how you get, came to those um, views around what you were doing. I think something uh, that I'd I'd love to ask in general to anyone who has any opinions on it would be, I guess, as for myself and for some of our uh, audience today, we're on the very, very early uh, end of our journeys and we're just sort of starting out and just trying to find our place uh, in this broad sort of spectrum that is medicine and, and the careers. And I guess, I think as VJ sort of touched on, sometimes we, we feel this push that we need to jump into a, a final pathway or join a a training program and, and sort of we can lose sight of the fact that this is probably the next 30, 40, 50 years of our life. Uh, but it feels like we need to get started now or we'll, we'll lose the whole entire amount of time. Um, and from, from listening to you all speak, it feels like you've really sort of embraced that journey that you've gone on. And, and I'd love to hear how you've gone about embracing it. Um, to no one in particular, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, I, I often think um, a couple, a couple of perspectives with this, right? When you get into medical school, that's one of the hardest parts of this journey. Uh, I think when you graduate, you're a doctor, and most of the time to the general public, you are a doctor, and most people don't really recognize the difference between a resident or a registrar or a, a consultant. So I think to the world, you're already, you, you arrive when you graduate from medical school. And in most, 
career, I don't think um, I don't think you get to that level of seniority which we're afforded in medicine. Some people don't get there for their whole career in most most other jobs. So I think um, you know when you get to become a consultant when you finish training, like there are all these different things you can do, but you pretty much reach that point in time in in your training, as far as I know. Where, where you're now a specialist and you have a bunch of doors open to you. But it, I think, um, like VJ said, there's no real rush to get there because there's a lot of other things you can do along the way. And by, by getting too focused on it, you might miss some of the other doors that could open to you. And for me, that's certainly been um, the thing. Uh, the ability, to, I've, I've had this... Um, approach of trying to say trying to embrace every opportunity and trying to see what's out there so i work as a doctor for um our national rugby league team on the gold coast and i um do a bunch of other fun things but there's so much you can do um when you graduate so i think just keeping an open mind about those opportunities good i think it is really nice to have that qualification where you finally finish training and when you're there but um you know, it's not always about the destination, right? It's about the journey. You've got to embrace the journey. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I, I, I would add to that that um, speed is a human defence. We're rushing around, we rush around. It's a defence to connecting in the moment. And um, we're not individuals. We're individuals in connection. Or an individual in connection to my life so i would ask what is the purpose of me and my life what is that relationship what is the purpose of that and what is it in service of and if i ask people that which i frequently do when i'm coaching most people would say um i'm looking for contentment i'm looking for calm emotional calm i'm looking to be content and actually the content is here, it's in that moment. Um, and how we rush on, we rush in the journey, we've got to get to the end. It's just a defence, it's a defence to being just here in the moment. And what are we defending against there? We're defending against uncomfortable emotions. Um, so if we can embrace the uncomfortable emotions and just think, oh, uh, it feels a bit, what, how do I feel is the first question I'd ask. How do I feel in this? this? And is this feeling belonging to me or is this feeling belonging to the relationship that I'm in with the things that are around me or the things that are in my life? So recognize the emotion and then just think about where it comes from and slow the world down enough to do that. Most people are rushing along because of the chatter that's in their head. Um, so if we can just defuse from the chatter, so rather than saying, this is, this is the common thing. I am useless. I am useless. I have to learn more. Rather than saying, I am useless, say, hmm. I notice I'm having that thought. I am useless. And just diffuse it a little bit so you can learn what emotion is here and learn how to connect. So the, the million dollar question I'd ask is what is the purpose between you and your life? And in service of what? That's me. I am uh, so sorry, but I'm being called away. So I'm going to tap out. Thank you to the amazing panelists and thanks for having me, Sarah. Take care. Thanks, Sinesh. Um, Sarah, I think I pick, can pick up from, sorry, I've got this uh, problem. Um, I think I can pick up from what Kate was saying there, but I just wonder whether we can turn this around a little bit, which is in looking for your end. I, I mean, Medicine to me is a service. It's actually not about us. And I think that sometimes the conversation, or it seems to me the conversation has changed a little bit, so that we're looking at the doctor's fulfillment, we're looking at your career, we're looking at where you want to be. And then you're saying, I want to be the consultant. I want to be the person who puts the forceps on or makes the decision or does the cesarean section. And to me, what, the risk of, of in that moment is that you're actually not valuing the patient who's in front of you. Because the patient who's in front of you is not interested in your career progression. They're, they're seeking your care. And so I think that the medical student 
the junior doctor, the person throughout their entire career has something to offer. And I think that when you don't value that, then you're actually doing yourself a disservice because you have qualities and things that you can contribute and you are doing the patient a disservice because she or he is looking for your care in that moment. And so it takes a long time to become competent enough to fly the aeroplane on your own. And it's not reasonable to have an expectation that you should be allowed to do that straight away. And so you need to go through that process and appreciate each, each part of it. If you value the job ultimately, then you'll recognise that there is no shortcut or there's no, um, there's no hurry to get there. Not in that there's no hurry as in enjoy the moment and all that sort of thing, but value the moment and recognise that it has importance as well. Uh, and I'd add to that, VJ, to say that um, who's best to know about the care that the patients need? Um, and, and that is the patients. And, and um, um, we often sort of, in our own head, we have a vision of what they need, or in our own head, we have this vision of what care looks like. Um, and we try to rescue people. We're sort of a, um, a, a world of rescuers. And just to take a moment back and just talk to them about um, and what is it you need from me in this moment? And how is this for you? Uh, and how is this for me? And we're in connection in this moment with the, pa you know, with the, with any patient or anybody in any moment. So I absolutely agree with that, BJ. And, and just adding to that, to to a bit of a, a, just a slow response rather than a reaction of I need to rescue you. Obviously, in some cases there are technical rescues, but um, a lot of the time, you know, just in service of the care that we deliver. Yeah, thank you to um, both of you for your thoughts, Sarah. And I think you're exactly right. I think our, our patients rely on us to, to be mindful and to be thoughtful with what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, it's our actions sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, caring for our patients and trying to seek to do our best, uh, whatever it might be for them, than necessarily our long-term goals and, and career aspirations that can sometimes distract us from just providing really good patient-centred care. Um, but I guess can I another add something to that, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Of course. But it's also the other message in all of this is not to take on this sort of overwhelming responsibility to save everybody as well, and this overwhelming responsibility to be really kind and caring and compassionate twenty four hours a day, because none of us have got that in us, and it requires a degree of honesty to say that at two o'clock in the morning, I'm really it's beautiful that you're having a baby, but I actually would prefer to be in bed, and at least I know that in my own head. I'm not going to convey that to the patient, but I'm honest about the fact that I don't sort of go around smiling inside all the time. And, and also just that concept of the good enough doctor, not the perfect doctor. You know, and I bet you every single person who's on this um, webinar tonight either or this morning in the UK is a, has a perfectionist personality because I'm yet to meet anybody who does medicine who doesn't. And the other thing that we've all got is an imposter syndrome. And it might interest all of you who are sitting there thinking, oh, there's Kate Burnett on the screen. Oh, there's VJ Roach. And they've got these titles and they're the important people. Well, we were nervous before we came on. We weren't sure what we were going to say. We worry about our operations and we have a complication. We think maybe if another surgeon done it then the complication wouldn't have occurred i'm, I'm assuming that you can feel this way but you can say whether you do or not but you know all of those self-doubts and that, that questioning oneself and that journey and that, that need to be perfect and that need to get it right all the time and that need to be the best doctor um they're ingrained in us and we've got to be you know, it goes all the way back right to the beginning when Kate introduced all of this is being gentle with yourself valuing Self recognizing that you are doing the best that you can, I think that ties in as well with not racing to get to some kind of mythical endpoint. Because I know for me, I'm at that endpoint. I've got no goals left to kick, no more titles, no more ways of doing operations or delivering babies that, that I need to do anymore. And it's not some kind of, you know, sense of fulfillment. I'm there. 
there's the, the journey still continues and the journey today is as interesting or as uninteresting as it was in the past. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, anxiety, you know, anxiety, all these things are human, normal human behaviours, holding the uncomfortable and holding the comfortable together in that dichotomy. And, and we can't, you know, no humanity can um, do that all the time. Um, and, you know, I, res I resonate, I resonate with what you say and I resonate with the need, you know, it's a need to do, it's a need to do. And just sitting back, I think is useful. Um, and yeah, I think that, that, I think, I think that that's, you know, that, that's useful. It's, it's, it's um, the other step I think is the reflection is to value self. You know, we can't value others until we value ourselves. So recognizing, you know, the things that we've done well in any moment, the things that uh, we've amplified, the things that we haven't quite noticed, just a step of reflection. And if we do those reflective steps all the time, you know, the world has to go very slow. It has to be really slow because there's no time otherwise just to do those sort of processes. So they're human development processes. Um, and is that being a doctor? Is that being an AHP? Is that being a nurse? Is that just being human? I think it's all those things, isn't it? You know, it's career independent, I think. And it's hard, isn't it, to care for somebody all the time? It's hard to be in that setting where we're, we're expected to care all the time. It's a difficult setting. Absolutely. I guess on, on the, the other side of the coin, uh, have either of you ever experienced time where you have lost sight of that sort of why um, and the meaning behind what you're doing? Uh, and how did you find motivation again uh, in those moments? Uh, I mean, I do all the time, get speedy. Um, um, and, and I think um, when you're in speed and you're rushing to, you know, rushing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next position to be bigger and better. And then one moment I had this, I had this moment where my eldest child, I'm rushing off in a minute to, to support her, but she said to me, um, are you too busy with work, mom? And I thought, oh, I've lost my way here somewhere. I'm not too busy with work. Or they'd knock on my office door. Um, I'm never too busy, you know, for, for connecting with my family. Um, but I obviously was was appearing too busy, and obviously I was appearing to, you know, and that that is a loss of my way. And um, and then just slowing down. Almost, it's so difficult. Sometimes it's so difficult to slow down that even if we slowed down, we wouldn't um, we wouldn't uh, survive the appraisal. The self appraisal so sometimes it's easy just to go more and more and more and more speedier and speedier so um i recommend slowing down and it's difficult to do okay slightly different angle which is that also we need to remember that we're all coming from a position of privilege and so and that privilege allows us to ask and answer the question that you just asked then Sarah because a lot of humanity doesn't get to ask that question and they don't have the luxuries that we have of making the choices that we make and so one of the things that I reflect on is as I said for me I see this as a life of service I see medicine as a vocation and I'm privileged to have the opportunity to do it and it's entirely my choice. No one's making me do this. And so, therefore, if I'm choosing to engage with that process, then that creates a certain level of obligation uh, to the patient because she doesn't have any choice. And with that will also come an element of sacrifice. And so, and I don't mean that in some kind of hair shirt, oh, woe is me type thing. And in fact, I think that's exactly the point. I don't think woe is me. The reality of my professional life has been that I, there have been things that I've missed out on. And, and, you know, thinking about family, that resonates with me strongly. But I also think that the reality is that my family has had me as a package deal. You know, they're certainly financially well off and their education and they've had a parent and well, parents with a good reputation. And we've had a position in our community and all those things that have gone with it. So is to see it all as a whole and not to not to separate it into components as much. And also, I think we need to be very careful about what we think we're entitled to as well. 
because there's a lot of the world that doesn't get that choice or that opportunity. Yeah, I resonate with that, you know, recognizing our own privilege. And that's not just positional privilege, is it? You know, it's internal privilege, education, uh, articulation, all those sort of privileges that, um, that, you know, that we have and often, often doctors do have, don't they? Societal pr privilege um, allows them to do things in society that, that, um, that others wouldn't. And so I, I absolutely resonate with that privilege. It's an important concept to think, consider. It isn't a positional in the way of being a doctor it is, but you know, doctors or health professionals, they want the position, don't they? As if that's gonna bring them power. And some of it does, but some of it, you know, is internal privilege. So recognizing we do have choice. Yeah, thank you to you both. And I think uh, that's such a, a powerful message to, to sort of tie up this panel on. And I know um, our speakers are very busy and have, we are all so grateful to have you both on our panel today and to contribute your thoughts and your feelings towards this topic. Um, I'm sure everyone in the audience has been uh, as wowed as myself uh, to listen to you both speak and, and to share sort of very openly and honestly about um, this topic. Uh, I'd love to, to use this opportunity to, to ask for any final thoughts or feelings, um, any final remarks that you'd like to share with our audience of uh, sort of current health professionals, both students um, and current health professionals in some part of their career, um, trying to find their why in their, in their life. I'd like to value them for the moments they've spent here. And I'd like them to value themselves. Thank you, Kate. And VJ, any last thoughts? Thanks. I suppose my, my last one will be, is it's all overwhelming. It's, it's, it's a big, huge world and you're all so young and you've got so much growing up to do and that's not your fault, it's just reality. And I don't say that in a patronising way, I say that just recognising my own journey and how immature I was and how much I had to learn and how overwhelming it all was. And it will continue to be, and that's okay. And so talk to each other, be gentle with yourself. You know, go to talk to people like Kate and who can make you feel good and warm and about yourself uh, and hear those messages because one of, there's nothing good about getting old. So I would suggest you don't do that. But it, when you do get old, what you do is we look at people like you, Sarah, and all of the people on the, on the, um, the chat and we think, wow, you're extraordinary. I mean, you're going to be my doctor one day. And that's a wonderful thing. And so gain that inspiration. It's all inside you. And, and realise how, well, um, again, Kate, you said, that, said it right from the beginning. Realise how valuable you are and how much we value you. Oh, goodness. I lasted so long in the meeting and I finally didn't unmute myself. Uh, I'm going to uh, tie up the session there today. Thank you again to our speakers, uh, Dr. Kate Burnett, Dr. Vijay Roach, as well as Dr. Dinesh, uh, who had to leave earlier, uh, for your wonderful contributions today. Um, and I'll pass it back to the Health Careers Live team uh, for the next session. Thank you. Thanks. Wow, what an incredible morning session to open with. I mean, your attitudes to life, work and family, the experiences you've had and how you reflect on this is truly inspiring. And you can even see the responses in the chat echoing the same thing. Absolutely. It was such a great, great session to begin with. Thanks so much to Sarah, BJ, Dinesh and Kate for giving up their time. Roger, I think you're muted. I was just, just saying, John, <laughs> it was such a great session to begin with and have yeah. such diversity in thoughts and to really empower us to really take charge of our futures and know that actually, as you said, Sarah, you know, it's been on a, on a conveyor belt. Um, you know, we can take time to have a look um, and really explore what's, what's meaningful for us. So thanks so much. Um, do we have um, any questions? Or I know that our speakers are also uh, very busy. Um, were there any in the chat that came up? Yeah, we've, we've, we've had some great feedback. And we've had people from Egypt, Kenya, 
Portugal, Australia, Scotland, wow. so many countries joining in. Um, one question here is how do we slow it all down? Um, another, these themes resonate in a world that moves so quick. Any closing thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I, I think um, to, 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 slow it all, to slow it all down. Um, um, so I think if you want to slow the world down, the world runs very, very quickly. The first thing to do is practice some mindfulness. Sounds, sounds a bit um, cheesy, but it's, it's very uh, useful to recognize the mind chatter. The second thing to do is just sit and notice what emotion you have. What is emotion? What emotion is here? And where is this emotion coming from? So what is emotion here? And then to voice it. I feel pain. I feel uncomfortable. I feel unsure. I feel happy. And just to voice it out there for a conversation because we're not individuals, we're individuals in connection. And then just to recognize what emotion is around, what emotion is around me and how much of the emotion that's around me am I picking up as my own and how much of the emotion needs to be delivered back to, to what's around me. The way to do that is to sit and just watch the television with the sound off and just notice, oh, what emotion's coming up for me here and what emotion do I see in the television? And if you continue to practice that, what emotion's here for me, what do I see in the television? What's here for me, what's in the television, what's here for me? And um, you'll start just to be validated by the world. So it's a technique to learn. And then try something that's uncomfortable. Um, you know, we came in, VJ said, um, we came in here, we felt anxious, I did feel anxious. The people, are, the people that are uh, uh, audience here probably feel a little bit anxious. And VJ and I are just picking up that as well as our own anxiety. So just recognizing then that we're in connection and the emotion that's here is the emotion that's just in me, but also in everybody else as well. So it doesn't belong just totally to it belongs to everybody as well. So passing it back. Oh, I feel pain here. Oh, it feels uncomfortable. What does that mean for us? That is the way just to slow down the world, just to recognize what's happening to you. Definitely. It, anyway. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your wise words. Sorry, I interrupted. Uh, I would say go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, because I think that that's the other thing. You know, we all, we're taking ourselves really seriously. Let's have fun. Let's read a book. Let's go to a movie. Let's go for a run. Do, let's do stuff. Let's interact with friends and family. And I reckon the key to success is work hard, party hard. You know, burn the candle at both ends. Because that's you know that makes you a complete human being, and then when you then and with, and family as Kate said before, enjoy your children, enjoy your friends and, and the rest of your family, and the things that excite you and interest you, and don't think I just have to be a doctor. I've got to do my study and I've got to um, learn how to operate. Is you will be the better doctor because you engage with the world. Let's get that trending. Hashtag work hard, play hard. Love it. Definitely. Well, thank you all so much for your time here today. We really appreciate your truly inspirational words of wisdom, and hopefully you guys at home have taken something from it too.